Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to talk to you guys about transforming businesses around customer journeys. But before we get into the detail, um, just a bit of an introduction to myself. So I'm Vicky Joshi, uh, a director at KPMG in the customer practice. I specialize in working with organizations to help them define what their customer experience strategy is going to be, um, how they would optimize their as-is customer journeys, and what they might want to do if they were going to redesign a fantastic journey in the future. Laura? Hi, uh, Laura Sharp, work in the experience design team at KPMG Nunwood. So super excited to be doing this webinar today. It's my first, so please bear with me. But um, yes, my day-to-day -day role is understanding what makes your customers tick across a number of different industries and businesses. Um, and really getting to the grips of how do we actually need to, to deliver better against customer needs in the future. So we'll just go on to, to what we're going to cover today. So today's agenda, um, we've got, if you like, four key elements to it. The first is what do we mean by customer journey mapping? So I think a variety of, you know, all organizations are probably talking about customer journey mapping uh, these days, but might have slightly different definitions. So we're going to start by taking you guys through our definition of customer journey mapping and what that means in terms of business transformation. If we were going to go off and deliver transformation through customer journeys in an ideal world, what do we believe the success factors are for embedding this? So we're going to talk about the five critical success factors, but then we want to move on to actually... The world isn't actually the ideal world at the moment, so sometimes we know that many different businesses have got different starting points, different challenges. Um, so in reality, how do we face those challenges and best overcome them? So we've got some practical hints and tips about how you would utilize journey mapping as part of business transformation. And then finally, any questions that you guys have got as we uh, progress through the, the session, uh, we'd be happy to answer at the end. Okay. So customer journey mapping, um, it became a bit of a buzzword, I guess, about five years ago. Uh, and since then, we've seen it take many different forms, shapes, definitions. Um, different businesses have different definitions. So they could be according to channel. So it's the online journey. They could be according to a product. It's the mortgage journey. So we've come across a number of different ones. And over the course of five years, as we've developed our customer journey mapping practice, we've established our definition. So when we're referring to journey mapping, we're referring to the process of capturing everything that customers experience towards their specific goal or objective. So essentially, we like to define it according to what is the customer's intended outcome, not the products, not the channel. Um, there could be a number of different channels and products existing, but what is the outcome? And that could be, you know, recovering if we're talking about healthcare. That could be, um, you know, getting my first home if we're talking about mortgages. But we need to help the customer to get to that outcome or objective. So the benefits um, that will just pop on your screen in a minute. So when we're talking about and thinking about the benefits of customer journey mapping, there are, there are many. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to a few here. So first and foremost, it allows us to walk in the shoes of our customers. Now, it's difficult when we're in a business and day-to-day -day life revolves around, you know, meeting business targets, etc., to really step away and think, what does the customer see and experience? We like to think about it as a theatre. So if you go into the theatre, the only thing you see is the front stage, and that's the only thing a customer sees. All the things behind that, the customer's not necessarily interested in. So when we're thinking about customer journey mapping, it's about walking in their shoes, what do they see and experience? What it also allows us to do is capture a visual representation, so just at the top right there, of the journey they take as they travel between various stages and touch points, be it over the phone, digitally, or in person. So this is really important, and when we go into businesses, we often find that the digital um, team will have matched their journey. Uh, you know, customer services might have a journey as well, but actually when we get people in a room together, how do, those, how do those channels, how do they actually holistically come together? Are they actually seamless? And, you know, we've actually had sessions where people have said, I didn't actually know we sent an email out there or I didn't know we called the customer. So really important that we capture that visually, what that holistic end-to-end -end looks like. 
We get on to the bottom left there. It's about taking control of the most important touch points and emotional hotspots. So it's about understanding what's important to customers, not just the business. We often find that, that our clients will be investing you know, a lot of money in, in things that actually when we talk to the customer aren't that important or aren't maybe that relevant. Um, so it's about, you know, is it important to send out five emails or should we actually think about calling them up after they've, they've put an order in with us? What matters to customers? How do they want to be contacted and interacted with? And then finally, it's about creating a framework. So we need, to, we need to start uniting. We need to start getting all these different departments that are potentially working in a siloed manner to, to come together and understand the end-to-end -end customer experience, working towards a collective goal, not an individual siloed, you know, KPI. We need to have a collective objective that is delivering better customer journeys. So... In our experience, the firms that are getting this right and are, are able to utilize customer journeys aren't just looking at customer journeys in isolation. So to Laura's point, the customer journey is the front stage. It's all of the things that a customer sees, feels, does in order to achieve their particular outcome or objective. But in terms of actually using this as a process for transformation across a business, it's really important that we connect that through to what does this mean for our operating costs? What does this mean in terms of uh, uh, being able to drive the right kind of commercial benefits, whether that's increased revenue um, uh, through conversion, et cetera? So customer journey mapping is only going to allow you to transform your business if you connect all of these different dots. Now, different organizations also will come at this from different angles. Some organizations will very much come at it from the cost reduction angle as a starting point. So I need to reduce cost in my operations. But I want to do that in a way that actually doesn't have any negative effect on the customer journey and is going to allow us to increase our revenue where possible. Now, the beauty of customer journey mapping is it allows you to start to understand which of the levers you, do you need to pull from a customer point of view in order to be able to deliver those kind of business and commercial outcomes. So in this particular slide, for example, if we were going to take the pre-purchase journey, um, we want to reduce cost by increasing recommendation, um, which is going to make sure that we don't need to do as much marketing investment. We need to understand in the pre-purchase journey what customers are doing, what matters, what's going to influence their behavior in order for them to go off and actually um, purchase that particular product. And by doing that through the lens of the customer journey, not through the lens of the business and what we believe is going to increase uh, recommendation, uh, it allows us to focus on the right things. So we're, we're going to meet the customer needs at the top of the sales funnel. If we were to take another um, section of that particular journey, let's talk about um, post-purchase. So the post-purchase journey, we want to make sure that we're reducing friction between different touch points. So for example, to Laura's point previously, as a customer, I want to be able to interact with you in, a, in any way I want to, at any time I want to, um, however I want to, and, get the, right, and the, get, get the same sort of experience and the right sort of outcome. In the post-purchase journey, we want to make sure that we are reducing friction between those touch points. So I might choose to interact with you, for example, in a digital channel. If you're not able to deliver the right kind of experience to me in that digital channel, that's going to force me into your contact center. Um, and that isn't an ideal experience for me from a customer perspective, but it's also increasing your operating costs of actually delivering that experience or that journey to that customer. So it's really, really important that we start to connect all of those dots so we understand the root cause um, and uh, what we need to do to alleviate some of those pain points that then drive, if you like, operational inefficiencies um, and have an impact on our ability to be able to drive the right kind of revenue that we're looking for. So, as I say, every organization might come at this from slightly different points of view. Some organizations are still very much in the, um, in the mindset that this is about, you know, let's map our, our operations, let's understand where we can reduce cost and take out complexity. Uh, some organizations come at this in terms of, okay, well, how do I increase, how do I uh, drive growth and increase revenue? Um, and other organizations actually come at it from a pure customer point of view. They, they think, they're thinking purely about how do I actually drive a better experience for my customer. But really, in order to use this as a transformation framework across the business, you've got to have all of these three things connected. Mm -hmm. But I guess where do you start? Well, 
you know, before we start thinking about, about how do we actually reduce those costs and increase that revenue, we need to actually get a, get a journey map together. <clears throat> so what do our journey maps incorporate? And again, these can be vastly different, just like people, you know, they come in all different shapes, sizes, combinations, and they contain different things. But when we're talking about a journey map, there's some core components. Now, I think the first thing you'll notice about this is the name of the map. So I want to protect my family. Now, we're talking here about a life insurance journey, um, but actually the customer's objective was about protecting that family. So that's critical. We need to establish what is the customer objective first. Then we've got a series of phases. So phases are high-level um, parts of the journey that encompass a number of different activities. So a phase might be research, a phase might be application, but within that, there's a whole host of different things customers might be doing. We've then got the physical aspects. What are the stages? What are the touch points? And what are the channels that people are using and how are they moving between that? Um, so this is really important, and it's important as well to make sure that we don't start to map our physical processes, um, you know, like, you know, dispatched from wherever it might be. We need to think, what does the customer see, what do they experience, and we need to capture that. We've then got pain and gain points, or pain points and moments of delight. So those are parts of the journey where we fundamentally find that it either changes a customer's behavior, so something happens and they do something different as a consequence, or it changes their perception of the brand. It's important that you have a definition for pain and gain points, otherwise you'll end up with thousands just based on the fact that they, you know, customers are slightly unhappy or it's not quite what they expected. So they fundamentally change those things. And we need to understand the rationale for those. Again, not from a business's point of view, from a customer's point of view. It takes much more time and energy and, and potentially misspent investment if we just base assumptions um, on what's, what's driving that pain or gain. And then we need to back it up. We need any supporting evidence and data. This can be business data, operational, customer. So anything we have that supports the message that we're, that we're putting out to the business about this end-to-end -end customer journey. Now, this design that we're showing you here is, is one produced in our Pathfinder, our um, mapping technology that we have at KPMG, but this isn't the only type of journey that we see. We can do, you know, we do very visual ones. It depends on the audience, and this is another point. You need to design a journey that will, that will engage the audience you're working with, and we, you know, that could be storyboarding, it could be something like this, um, and it could be something entirely different. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an example now um, about, we've talked about journey mapping, we've talked about what it means, how we define it, how it can impact cost and revenue, but let's actually talk about someone that's made this work and, and has really seen some success. So this um, is a financial services provider, um, and a while ago they were known for having a very poor customer, customer service. So they, had, they were, had a very bad reputation in terms of customers being able to contact them, them getting what they needed from this financial services provider, and they decided that actually it was time to make a change and make a big change. So what they decided to do was focus on a hero product. This was going to change their reputation. This was going to make them known for customer experience. And what they did was they started out and said, blank canvas, let's design this based on customer wants and needs. What does the customer want this journey to look like? And that was what led all of the processes, all of the systems, all of the you know, service requirements were determined based on the customer experience and what that needed to look like. This was driven hard by the CEO as well. And I think that's really important. And we'll come on to this in a bit more detail. Um, but that's a really, a really good driver in, in businesses of, of starting to push customer forward. Now, in the process of three years from our CE, they flew up the rankings 141 places following the launch of this product. If we look down the right-hand side, there's a number of different um, outcomes that they also got. So they increased the CSAT for joining to 97%, an NPS score of 89. So for those of you that are on the, on the webinar who work in financial services, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing um, from an NPS. They reduced fulfillment times by 75%, increased revenues of 17, 
15% increase in conversion and complaints have reduced by 25%. So we see that big impact, you know, big numbers. It, it just demonstrates the value that journey mapping can add. Okay, so moving on now to start to think about what are the critical success, success factors. So in that particular example, we've seen that actually by starting with the needs of the customer, um, that organization was able to effectively design the way it was going to deliver that experience, its processes, its people, its technology requirements, um, to drive the right kind of customer and the business benefit. So we talk about this and we, we start to think about the five um, success factors, and the first one being senior leadership and buy-in and sponsorship is absolutely critical. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more detail uh, and examples of where that's worked and where that might not work so well. Um, it's important if you're going to utilize customer journeys that you have a set of rules or principles for customer transformation. So you start to think about actually how would any change across the organization need to be managed uh, and monitored in order to make sure that we're doing things in a consistent customer-led uh, way. It's really important to make sure that it's insight-led, whether that's both from the outside in, so that's from a customer perspective, and also from the inside out. Your organization will have a huge amount of information already about what's working and what's not working across that journey. It's very important that you complement that with real insight from your customers. It needs to be about cross-functional collaboration. It needs to link through to internal processes, the employee experience. None of these things can be designed or changed in isolation. They all need to be connected back to the customer journey framework. And in order for this to become a successful mode of um, business transformation, you need to be able to embed it into your, if you like, your kind of BAU uh, way of doing things. So this should not be about going off and doing a program of work to transform a journey over a period of weeks, months, or even years. This, once you've got it up and running, needs to be a continuous way of managing your experience and where you're going to focus your effort in your business. So starting with um, senior leadership and buy-in, we know, um, I guess through our, through our time we're working with a number of different organizations, that in order for this to be something that everybody across the organization sees, believes, and feels part of, that it first and foremost uh, needs to come from the senior leadership. So the CEO needs to believe this. They need to be flying the flag for the business, clearly communicating the importance of actually having a customer centricity, centricity <laughs> easy for me to say, uh, for customer centricity to be very much the core of the way that the business is going to uh, transform and do things moving forward. In order to be able to do that, they've got to be accountable. They've got to sponsor this, they've got to be accountable, and they've got to take ownership of customer experience improvements. Customer experience is not just about the guys on the front line that are dealing with customers day in, day out. It's not just about the middle management that might be making decisions that influence and impact that journey. It's about everybody across that organization, top down, making sure that they are doing things that have a customer-centric um, uh, decision-making process in place. And that needs to be um, seen and felt across the organization. So they need to make sure that their employees um, see them acting in a customer first way. If the uh, board of an organization are making decisions purely based on um, you know, cut rate, cutting, uh, cutting costs, or they um, don't feel like they are connecting that back to the experience, and it's very difficult for other people across the organization to take this framework and utilize it on a day-to-day -day basis. The final thing I would just say on this one is customer experience needs to be a strategic priority for that business. So it needs to be clearly linked through to the organization strategy. Now, for many organizations, they've got a, a very kind of clear link between their, their overall strategy and their customer strategy. In other organizations we work with, when, I, when we go out and we speak to them and we ask them what their customer strategy is, um, they might talk to us purely about, well, we know that we've got these three segments and we, we want to go off and deliver against those, uh, those three segments. It's really, really important that um, there is a clear customer strategy in place that's linked through to customer first transformation in order to make this real. The next thing you need to consider is having a set of principles that are going to allow you to use customer journeys as a mode for transformation. So these principles need to be, if you like, a set of rules and guides um, that everybody across the organization utilize in order to make sure that you're all doing things in a similar way. So 
one of the first things you need to make sure is that everybody understands and defines a journey in the same way. So as we've already talked about, a journey is a customer goal. Um, it should not be broken down into a specific channel or product. Uh, we need to think about this first and foremost from um, a customer point of view and what it is they are trying to achieve, not based on the way that our business is currently operating. The second thing uh, needs to be that we need to capture three key layers. The first, the rational. So what are the questions that our customers are asking uh, us to answer as they go through that journey with us? Whether those are subconscious or conscious questions, uh, we need to capture those and make sure that as we're delivering that experience, we're delivering against those needs. What physically do they have to go through in order to achieve their objective? So which channels do they interact with? Um, where do they have to put in the time and the effort versus where can we potentially take out some of that complexity for them? And finally, the emotional journey. Not every single experience needs to drive an emotion. That's one of the most important things to remember. Sometimes it's just good to have an experience that people don't even really remember. They just go through it, and it's simple and it's easy. But there are certain points in a journey that you want somebody to feel a particular emotion. So it's about understanding how you can make sure that you invoke that emotion, how you deliver that consistently, um, and how you make sure that those emotions are positive and not negative. You want to establish a universal language and framework. So again, coming back to the point that each organization probably has got a different starting point and a different way of doing things. What's important is not that you have the same framework in place as the organization up the road or your peers. It's that you have a consistent language and framework in place across your organization. So you don't have different departments doing things in different ways, but all under the heading of customer journey transformation. Always start with the as is. Um, you know, again, there's always a temptation to begin to go off and design something fancy for the future. But if you don't know what you're currently delivering and where you are today, it's very difficult to then design for the future and understand what the roadmap for change will look like. Um, use customer journeys to establish that single view. So it's about having um, one clearly understood view about what matters to customers, what they go through, um, and how uh, they achieve that particular objective. Again, different departments tend to have different visions or different views about what they believe um, that experience looks like. What we're trying to do is get one view for your organization. Uh, make sure you do your customer research, both inside out and outside in. You need to um, map, your map needs to drive action. So it needs to be linked back through to your kind of operations, your commercial and your employee measures. We know that great customer experiences are delivered uh, by organizations that have great employee experiences, for example. It's important that we connect all of those dots. And it needs to be embedded as a BAU framework. So that means that once you've got um, your journey up and running, you understand what you're going to go and transform. You need to be able to measure and monitor that on an ongoing basis. You need to be able to manage that day in, day out. And it's got to have a direct feed into both strategic and tactical uh, initiatives across the organization. So when we're talking about insight-led, um, as we've talked about already, it's really, really important that insight customer experience design, change teams across the organization uh, are all coming to, together through an insight-led framework, and this isn't based on perception. So to the point that I've just made, make sure you capture your as-is journey. That is through primary customer research, employee research, um, looking at your process. So there's absolutely, you know, where, where customer journey has become even more powerful is when you've got your, your customer journey, you've got your employee journey underpinning it, and you've got your processes and your systems and everything else um, as your, as your next layer. If you can see those three things together, that allows you to understand which of these things do you need to ch change in order to affect positive change across all three layers and not just one. You need to establish your priorities for transformation. Actually, what is it that we're trying to transform? Do we just want to be good enough uh, and make sure that we're making the experience as good as it possibly can be without going out and doing stuff that wows people all the time? Um, is it all around operational efficiency and driving out costs and just making sure that we're not doing anything that's got a detrimental impact on the customer journey? You need to be able to understand where you want to prioritize and what the factors for prioritization are. When you go off and implement your change, it's important to, to very much use your um, 
your priorities and the information that you've collected to design your solutions, to think about what your minimum viable experience or product might look like in the future, and design your roadmap that is linked back to your business's capabilities. So don't, just because a customer says that they want you to do something in two days, if your business is not capable of doing it in two days, your business is capable of doing it in five days, um, and that's already a reduction of 50% on the 10 days you're doing it at the moment. Your end goal should always be your two days, but you might need to have an interim step that says, actually, guys, in the, in the middle, we're going to be able to deliver this in five days. And it's actually about how we communicate that to customers that's going to um, take away some of the pain in the journey uh, in the short term. And then to the point around actually how do we make sure this is insight-led on an ongoing basis, we need to monitor our success. Um, through a number of different measures. And different KPIs will be um, appropriate for different journeys and different stages in that journey. So it's about identifying what those KPIs are and measuring those on an ongoing basis. So what does all of this mean for cross-functional collaboration is the next question. So many organizations that we work with still have quite traditional operating models um, where we see sort of siloed departments um, that all technically have got their own set of actions, objectives, KPIs that they're working to. Now, the customer journey framework is a framework which, would, which should allow a business to break down some of those silos. Everybody should be working towards a common goal. So in order to be able to do that, though, it's really important that the organization is able to um, bring all of those different departments on the journey. So in order to do um, to utilize a customer journey framework uh, effectively, you can't have um, a workshop internally with just the guys on the front line. We need to make sure that we've got people from all of the different channels, all of the different work streams, for example, all of the different functions um, involved and collaborating together to identify what that as its experience um, looks like and also when we're thinking about redesigning it for the future. By bringing all of these people together, and actually we tend to see a number of different outcomes. The first one is it improves communication and embeds that universal language that we've been talking about. So technically, um, many departments might feel like there is some friction when it comes to actually being able to hand off between mm -hmm. one department and the next. Um, by getting everybody in the room, understanding what the collective customer objective is, uh, we tend to see that that really improves communication moving forward and allows the organization to better deliver against the needs of those customers. It also generates ownership of customer experience improvements. So often organizations believe there are clear owners for different stages in a journey. Uh, only when you bring everybody together around a single view do we start to realize that there are gaps in that ownership, or actually there might be two or three different departments that all believe that they own a particular touch point um, and are all delivering that experience in quite different ways. So we need to, we need to uh, uncover that and build um, a, if you like, a kind of a, a clear understanding of who owns what. We also um, want to make sure that we've got this kind of holistic understanding of the end-to-end -end journey. When you bring everybody together, you get the aha moments that you don't get when you talk to them all in their individual silos. Mm -hmm. The aha moment that says, actually, we've made a change at this point or this stage in the journey, and that's actually having a negative influence on our customers and um, my colleagues in this team when they're trying to you know, deliver fulfillment at this stage in the journey. Again, the aha moment is incredibly powerful in terms of being able to embed a customer journey framework as a means for change. Um, and that, I guess, leads us through to this kind of creates a continuous um, uh, improvement culture. So what we're trying to do by utilizing a customer journey framework is help people understand those aha moments, understand what they own and, the, um, and how those interactions that they own uh, influence the experience from a customer point of view and from a colleague and the systems and the process point of view. So it's really important that we start to drive the right kind of culture mm -hmm. um, through utilizing a framework like this. And then... How do we then create a, I guess, um, a customer journey uh, framework as sort of for BAU transformation? Again, and this is just this is touching on many of the points that we've already made. But you need to set and embed your set of principles so everybody across the organisation is doing this in a similar way. You need to share your, um, if you like, your future vision state for your customer journeys. People need to know where it is they're trying to transform towards. What is it that we're actually trying to get to? We need to clearly align that to a set of KPIs, whether those are customer, operational, or business. Again, different stages in the journey will have different um, KPIs that are particularly pertinent at that point. 
you need to then go off and be able to make and embed the changes that you need to do to deliver a better experience for your customers or a better experience for your employees or a more efficient um, process in order to deliver that experience. You need to monitor that and measure that in real time. So you need to be able to capture information in the moment that allows you to say, actually, we need to course correct this. So some of the changes that we've embedded are not actually having the desired outcome. Um, and in order to understand what the desired outcome is, this needs to come back to ownership. So we need to make customer experience part of our business's performance uh, and, um, and kind of business management framework. So again, it comes back to ownership right from a senior level to the guys that are in charge of making those individual changes to the experience. Okay, so we've talked in a bit more detail about those now, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a poll, we're going to do some questions, and we're going to have some voting. So what you guys will see in a minute is a series of answers to the questions. So we want to know from you guys, which of the factors that we've talked about is most difficult to embed within your organization? Is it senior leadership and buy-in? getting that sponsorship? Is it a set of rules or principles for customer transformation? Is it getting that insight led from an outside in and an inside out perspective? Is it cross-functional collaboration, you know, bringing people together? We often find that that's quite a, quite a biggie. Um, or is it actually getting that framework and getting that framework embedded as BAU? So just over the next 20 seconds or so, um, it would be fantastic if you could just submit your your answers, um, and then we'll talk through those in a bit more detail. And, and I guess what we want to talk about next is we understand and we know that all of these factors, all of these success factors, are more easily said than done. So yeah. we know businesses can be in entirely different places. In fact, every business that we, we talk to has, is coming from a different place. So you might have you know, senior leadership sponsorship on this, but you might not have a framework, um, and we appreciate that that can vary quite a bit. So what we're going to talk through just in a minute is how do we actually start to overcome those challenges? What are the actual things that, that from whether you're in the insight team or customer experience team, whether you're a product owner, what are the kinds of things that you can start to do to overcome those? Okay. So what we'll do now is we will look at the results. <laughs> um, so you'll see this on your, on, your, on your screens in a second, guys. There we okay. go. Okay. Woohoo. The results are in. Interesting, and this is, um, I guess, aligns to what we were saying, cross-functional collaboration coming in there. And, you know, we've been in businesses before where it's been a case of, fundamentally, I will not work with that other team on this. That's not my job. Um, next, senior leadership and buy-in. Absolutely, this is one that we come across a lot. And one we find that is probably one of the most difficult to overcome. Coming on from that, creating a framework it's difficult, and it's difficult because every business works differently. And, you know, it's about understanding how can we develop a framework that will work for our business, the way our business is set up for the immediate future, but in longer term. The set of rules and principles, and then thinking insight-led. Um, so that's interesting that insight-led coming, coming in yeah. there as, as seen as the, one of the least difficult. So what I'm going to talk through now is... In reality, what does the reality actually look like? How do we actually start to overcome these things? So the first thing um, I'll talk about, and it will come on your screen in just a minute, is most organizations work in silos. This is the most common um, problem that we have um, or we find. And we'll talk about all the different parts that you just voted on there, but we'll start with this one. The, the problem with that is it reduces opportunities to collaborate and it throws up barriers to change, okay? So what, what would we recommend that you do? First and foremost, and this is one of the things we always do when we talk to a business, have one-to-one -one sessions with the stakeholders. You know, chat to them, spend an hour with them, understand what is it that's actually driving those silos. Is it KPIs in the business? Is it just the structure? Or are there, is there other stuff going on? So first and foremost, let's get those diagnosed. 
Running as is, you know, internal CGM sessions is a fantastic way to start to get people to recognize that a siloed way of working does not contribute to great customer experiences. What it contributes to is fragmented customer experiences. And ultimately, the objective needs to be we're working towards, you know, or from the same hymn sheet here. So get those people in a room together and let's start to get them to recognize what that journey looks like. And then let's establish that common goal and those common KPIs. What, what, what should we all be contributing to? What is the North Star, if you like, for the business? So spend time with these people, get them in a room together, and start to establish these common goals. Yes. So just to build on that, what you don't want to do is to go in there and establish a framework without understanding some of these challenges mm -hmm. that are already existing within the organization because people will be less receptive mm -hmm. to taking that on board. So if everybody feels like they've had input and ownership at a very early stage, then they are far more likely to collaborate and work together yeah. uh, because they feel like they've influenced it. Mm -hmm. So next one, the lack of leadership buy-in. As we said there, and this came out in the poll, I guess, that this is one of the most difficult. And we recognize that having that lack of, of buy-in um, and driving that from the top has an effect on, on the organization's attitude to it. So if we, if we don't have that sponsorship, people don't think that they should put it as, a, as important. So how do we start to overcome these things? Key thing we always find is to start to build a business case. Now, when we talk about building a business case, you don't have to do this just using what you have available to you in your business. There's a whole host of other things out there. You know, we showed you a case study today. We have a whole wealth of resources on this kind of stuff on our Customer Experience Excellence Center. Um, and start to, you know, bring in case studies where other businesses have adopted this, other businesses have driven customer and the benefits they've seen. But do also use any data that you have. And this brings us on to the next point. Identifying documenting where it's detrimental to the business because of a poor experience. So we often find that if we're focused on profit, that actually we'll be driving you know, some immediate sales and we're trying to convert every customer. What we're doing there is pushing a load of customers away because they don't feel they're getting the experience they wanted. In turn, that reduces the amount of customers that are going to come knocking on our door next year or next week, whenever that is. So actually, we get less footfall, less traffic, etc. So we need to start to connect the dots. What are the things that we're driving now impacting on our experience? Um, and identify the data sources you do have, as well as those KPIs. What are the things that you need to start measuring? If you have a lack of data or big gaps in your data, you know, what kinds of things can you start to implement to, to plug those gaps and start to support this message to the, to the leadership team? So, again, we've worked with many organizations where the leadership fully buy into this. They understand the importance of a customer-first transformation or way of working just generally across the organization. There are other organizations where it is more the middle managers or the middle management layer that really understand this and want to drive it forward. Um, but I, I then having to, if you like, sort of sell it in up the line. Um, and to Laura's point, it's about actually how do you sell that in and how do you demonstrate that this has got value. And for many businesses, it might be about not going off and trying to transform an entire journey. Um, it might be about going off and coming up with some tangible proof points. And those tangible proof points might be taking a stage in a journey that you know is a particular pain point for customers at this point in time that's driving you know, um, failure demand into your contact centers mm -hmm. and um, is costing the business X, Y, Z. If, you, if you're able to, if you like, redesign some very small, tangible parts of that experience that have the right kind of impact on the customer and the business, take that back up um, to your senior leadership. That, again, starts to just help them understand actually the impact and the, uh, mm -hmm. that this could have if you were to roll it out more consistently across the business. Mm -hmm. So next, um, pressure on the business to deliver customer initiatives that can be measured in terms of financial business benefits. We get this a lot. Okay, it's going to cost me that much, but how much am I going to make? Or, you know, how much is it going to take for me to increase my revenue by X percent? It's difficult. And again, it's difficult to, to predict how much you're going, to, you're going to change you're going to make and how much that's actually going to benefit the business. But to Vicky's point and what we've just discussed there as well, start to align those customer and business KPIs. We need to start to recognize, okay, so if we're measuring CSAT here, how much is that reducing um, the cost to serve. So let's start to connect those dots um, and put those actually together. 
combine customer journey mapping and lean methods. So the two go hand in hand, um, and we do a lot of this here at KPMG, um, Nunwood, is putting the two together. So when we're looking at the journey, what are the things that sit behind the journey that aren't being effective, that aren't driving good experiences? Let's start to strip those out and work in a way that's cost effective, but also enhancing that customer experience. Use the insight that you get from your customer experience to improve conversion and retention rates. Now, this is you know, a bit of a sweeping statement, it, you might say, but it, it, so it is that powerful. You know, if you understand what the questions are that the customer is trying to, trying to answer, you can then start to answer those questions in the right way by the right channels, and you can then start to drive that conversion and drive that retention, because ultimately, the customer doesn't have to do anything or go anywhere else. Customer journey maps not being used to drive improvement. In essence, customer journey maps being put in a cupboard and forgotten about and they collect dust. So this is something and a problem that we've, we've come against a number of times is that because it was a buzzword, people started to do journey mapping, but once they got the map, they weren't quite sure what to do with it and they, they put it in a cupboard. So the problem that we find here is it's actually down to not using that map and not using, you know, what we want to do in the future, and analyzing the gaps. Where are we today? Where do we want to get to? That's how you make your, that a powerful tool for the business, okay? So how do we overcome that? Create solutions based on your findings with a cross-functional team. Again, maintain that buy-in. But you'll find when you've mapped your as -is journey, there's a series of pain points, Throughout that, you need to start designing solutions to fix those, to overcome those, and do that with a team that is cross-functional. Start to generate those fixes. Develop a comprehensive action plan with assigned ownership. So again, we can't just figure out what we want to do. We have to actually get a plan together for doing it. Um, and that has to be owned across different departments, not just by one person sitting in one team. And you need to ground that action in customer needs and business capability. I think this comes back to what Vicky said before. We can't just action a change if we can't actually do it. And we certainly don't want to tell customers we're going to do something radical if it's not going to come to fruition. So what can we actually do in the short, in the medium, and in the long term? The next one that you'll see in just a minute is thinking about creating maps just from the business's point of view, it can result in misspent investment um, due to a lack of customer validation. So we've often been to businesses and they've said, right, we've got it, we've got our maps. And when we actually assess and review those maps, they're process maps or they're just from the internal perspective. Now, the problem with that is it's often based on assumption um, or it's based on the processes and that's driving our view of that. We have to, um, and we always advocate, validating those assumptions with primary customer research. There has never been a case or a project that I've worked on where we haven't found fundamental gaps between what the business thinks the customer journey looks like and what customers actually experience. You have to go and talk to, to those customers. And you have to then prioritize your improvements based on balanced customer and operational data. Um, you know, if we tip the scales too far towards customer and try to you know, give them everything they want, that could end up in us going bust because we've spent all our pennies. But equally, if we just think about the financial or the operational impact, we might then give customers a poor experience and lose customers as a consequence. So we need to balance these. What's going to drive you know, happy customers, but what's financially and commercially viable? And then I guess it comes right back to the start is it's not just a buzzword. It's not just something that we should be seen to be doing. Um, and we often find that that can be the case. So we have to embed it. It has to be, we, you know, when we talk about it, we actually mean it. And this is going to become part of our way of life as a business. Um, it can't just be left to the responsibility of, you know, Joe Bloggs in the Insight team or the marketing department. It becomes everyone's job to make, you know, the customer experience great. In terms of getting that transformation going, you need to establish a working group. So a group that's going to take responsibility for implementation. And no, this might not be their only job. It might be part of their you know, day-to-day -day job. But get that working group together and start that ball rolling. 
We need to ultimately incentivise employees to action these improvements. We recognise that you can't change everything and ask people to do things fundamentally differently unless you're actually going to give them a benefit of doing that. So incentivise them, make it worth their while to drive better experiences. And make it everyone's, everyone's responsibility. You know, it has to be a drive for the business. It has to be coming from the top and part of everyone's day-to-day -day lives at the business. Great. So thank you um, for those people that have actually submitted questions. Um, one of the questions that I just wanted to pick up on was, um, to develop or maintain differenti differentiation and appeal, shouldn't the brand positioning, values, and tone of voice play a central role? Yes, they certainly should. They should oh, sorry, he says choking. They certainly should. Um, However, each organization um, will have a different starting point. So we talked earlier about the, if you like, what an organization strategy is, what they're trying to achieve. Um, customer journey mapping as a framework for change needs to be clearly linked through to the organization's strand, uh, strategy, uh, its brand, uh, and whether that strategy is all about, if you like, sort of just making sure the experience is as good as it possibly can be, whether that needs to be a differentiated brand experience, um, so these things all need to be connected, and there's a lot of work to do for organizations to be able to um, go off and define, if you like, a set of principles that are going to allow them to design and deliver journeys that are effectively delivering their brand and their values. So the answer is yes, it will drive differentiation, um, but for many organizations, they're not starting from the point of, I want to be able to drive differentiation. Mm -hmm. What they want to be able to do is optimize their experience and make it as good as it possibly can be today mm -hmm. and take out some of that pain. And once they've got the experience um, across those end-to-end -end journeys as great as it possibly can be, that's when they start to think about some of these kind of differentiation wow moments that are going to allow people to uh, clearly link that back to the brand and feel like they're getting that branded um, experience day in and day out. Um, one of the other questions that we've had is, uh, where do I start in terms of onboarding uh, other departments in the business? Um, one of the critical things that we, we find is um, before you start any piece of um, sort of transformation work, we need to understand who the critical stakeholders are and all the different departments that need to be part of this. So you start with a um, series of stakeholder mapping uh, to understand all of the different um, departments that would um, influence those journeys. Uh, once you've mapped those stakeholders, um, it comes back to some of the points that we've just talked about previously. It's about getting those stakeholders together, spending time with them both individually so you can understand their ways of working, what their motivations are and what they're trying to achieve. Um, but also, um, if we were then, you bring them back together to collaborate on understanding what the other's experience is and how that um, might look both today and what it could look like in the future. So it's about bringing everybody with us on this journey, making mm -hmm. sure that they feel like they're, they're part of it from day one, that this is not a framework that's imposed on them, it's a framework that they're part of and that they are sculpturing uh, with the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. um, and effectively, over time, it, you know, it takes time for the business to, to change its ways of working and to break down some of those silos, uh, but we've seen this happen very effectively in a number of businesses. Awesome. We've just got another one here, and this is a, a, an excellent question, actually. Are there any tools to assess the level of CX maturity for companies that have already done any efforts? Absolutely. This is something that we always do. Any business that we talk to, we'll always spend a period of, be it a week or a month, spending time in the business to essentially gauge the level of CX maturity. And we need to gauge that maturity against the things that we've talked about, you know, is there sponsorship, is there buy-in, um, have, we, have we got the capability within the organization. Now, in terms of tools, um, it can be done in a number of different ways. So some businesses will do it numerically, so what is the score for our maturity? But we always advocate just essentially getting someone unbiased that can do an assessment, and that is done on the basis of reviewing your data, so actually what data do you have versus what data would you ideally need to, to manage and monitor those customer experiences. Stakeholder interviews, but when we say stakeholders, it's from all angles of the business. So it's not just you know the, the board or the leadership team, it's the marketing, it's your frontline employees. Spend time, you know, whatever your business may be, if it's a hospital, spend time in the hospital, see what customers experience day to day and really get a picture of that. Now, 
once you get all this kind of research, if you like, within the business, we have a structure for um, creating a report, if you like, and that diagnoses the business against those success factors. So really breaking down not only what's going on, but how can we actually start to think about overcoming some of those things and what are going to be the barriers to change you know what are going to be the fundamental things that that might stop us and that might be cultural that might be capability but yes absolutely spend time at reviewing that cx maturity and i'd say the last thing there is you can measure how well you are currently delivering against the needs mm -hmm. of customers and whether that's working for your employees and the impact that might be having on your process so um, by going and utilizing a customer journey framework, you um, are able to go out there and say, for example, across our six pillars of customer experience excellence, which of these things are we currently delivering well versus which of these things are we not delivering very well on at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, where are the particular stages or, or, or um, touch points in our journey that are working and not working? Some things are happening consistently, other things are not happening consistently. So there is an assessment of how the business is um, currently able to, um, if you like, drive a customer centric way of working but there's also something around actually being able to gather primary data that tells you actually these are the things that are working and not working right now um, and this is where you might want to focus um, so we've got quite a few I questions think, yeah. so I'm um, just uh, answering a couple of uh, others really so any tips on um, logistically how you take um, a journey map um, and any of the tools? So how do you physically take your post-it notes off a wall uh, and turn that into a digital format that helps visualize the journey end to end? There are a number of different tools um, that are available on the market. Um, as part of the KPMG Customer Experience Cloud, um, our Pathfinder solution um, allows you to take the journeys that you've mapped and very quickly um, take that information and translate that into a digital format and a digital map that you can then share across the organization. Uh, there are other tools um, out there on the market as well. So again, you know, journeys can be as complex or as sophisticated as you want to make them. They can also be very simple. Some organizations will have very simplistic ways um, of just utilizing PowerPoint, uh, even Excel um, as, as a method for mapping those journeys and allowing the organization to interact with them. Mm -hmm. This is a really good one, actually, and one we were actually talking about um, earlier on today. Can you talk more about the prioritization of issues or opportunities from the customer journey map? Absolutely. First and foremost, what, what is your business's strategy? What are your objectives? What are you working towards? Who are your target customers? What is your target experience? So you need to have those. So First and foremost, what are we working towards? And, and that's number one, I guess. That's what we start, need to start thinking about against that. So let's say, for example, we are targeting, I, I don't know, millennials or, or whatever it might be. Okay, so we need to really start to think about how we're delivering against those people's needs. We then need to have a look at the data or we need to get some data on how we are actually delivering. So, you know, quantifying where those pain points actually come out. So we can't just base it on a qualitative sample of 10. We need to actually measure where is, where is this most affecting people, so how many people are moving through that part of the journey, but then how is it affecting them? What is it stopping them from doing? So think about your strategy, think about your objective, and then quantify where the pain is occurring and how many people that's impacting, and start, start from there, I guess, start to fix it. And then, you know, this isn't just about having a, pro a prioritization framework, which is a pure customer-based prioritization mm -hmm. framework, coming back to the points we made earlier. You need to identify how um, all the different things that you, you're, you're trying to affect. So you're trying to affect a better customer experience, a better, um, you know, more effective operation, uh, more engaged employees, for example, and a better business outcome. You can apply a weighting to each of those that says actually, well, 50% of how we want to make the decisions about where we're going to prioritize is based on the customer impact, um, and we're going to have an equal weighting for the other three, for example. You need to have a measure attached to each of those, and you can effectively then use that as your prioritization. So again, to Laura's point, what's your strategy, what are you trying to achieve, which of those things is most influential and important, come up with a prioritization um, method that you can utilize kind of quantitative mm -hmm. data, uh, and that should allow you to understand, okay, these are the top three or top five things that we need to focus on first, and this is how we're going to measure whether we've been successful or not on an ongoing basis. So, um, I think we've now come to the end. 
Um, so I'd like to just thank everybody for their, their time. I hope everybody was munching away on their sandwiches um, as we chatted, <laughs> through, uh, chatted through the slides. Um, for anybody that we didn't manage to get back to um, your questions, we'd be happy to, to respond to those directly, if that's helpful. Um, and if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to submit those. Yeah. Or I guess, uh, you know, feel free to link in with us or connect with us, um, you know, by any means. We'll, we're happy to help, and I guess we live and breathe this stuff day to day, so we want to spread the customer experience word. But, yes, yeah, thank you for joining us, um, and we hope that was useful.